Hey, what's going on guys? Welcome back to Network Chuck. I made a mistake in my last video. I talked about Docker, this really amazing thing that allows us to virtualize our operating system. Uh, maybe people got mad at me for that, but it, it kind of does. But I made a mistake. I said something wrong and um, it's not like crazy wrong, but it's still wrong. And I, I felt like I needed to make a video to talk about this. In the video, I talked about how the cool thing about Docker is that you can spin up virtual machines super wicked fast. And by the way, if you don't know what Docker is, go find out what it is. Go watch my last video where I talked about it. It's exciting. It's really fun. And um, I think it can replace virtual machines. Now, I won't have every single thing a virtual machine has, but as far as like what we're going to do with our infrastructure, it's everyone's kind of going that way. Anyways, I know there's a lot more to that world. I know there's Kubernetes and everything, but... Netties. I don't know. We'll talk about that later. But for now, let's correct myself. <laughs> um, I said that you can only run Linux Docker containers on a Linux based OS, and you could only run Windows based Docker containers on Windows based OSs. Half of that is true. Uh, and I've got to tell you why. Um, and can everyone hear me, by the way? Can you hear me fine? Let me know in the, the uh, comments or chat. So, and this will be a quick one, by the way, really quick uh, live stream. And I'll, sh I'll demonstrate, I'll show you what I'm gonna do here. You can run Linux Docker containers on a Windows system. I believe Windows 10 and Windows Server 2016 and up. Um, I know for sure Windows 10 because I just did it. Uh, but yeah, you can run Linux based Docker containers thanks to the Windows sus subsystem for Linux 2, which is, um, you can basically run anything on Linux or Linux based on your Windows machine, which is kind of amazing. Yeah, yeah, you can run Windows on Linux. We've known that for a bit. I've talked about that, but you can run Linux Docker containers on Windows, which is just, it makes sense. And I should have known that, um, but it's cool. It's really cool. So let's, you know, let's stop talking about it. Let's, let's look at it. Let's demonstrate it. So I'm going to switch to my display here and, uh, Yes, yeah, someone said, I figured this would be a WSL thing, a Windows subsystem for Linux thing, thing, whatever. Um, you're right. So let me make sure my display is like looking okay. Cool, cool. So this is the website. I put a link below. Or actually, no, this is not the website. This is the website to get started with Docker for Windows. Super simple, actually. Super surprisingly easy. Um, so easy that I could do it really quickly. So I'm going to show you right now. Um, essentially, you go to Docker Hub. You uh, download the Docker desktop for Windows application, there is one caveat, one kind of big one is, and that's, um, you can only operate in one mode. One mode being you can, you can run Docker containers based on Linux or the other mode, run it based on Windows. From what I understand, you can't run both at the same time. Um, I'm fully aware that someone might say, oh, you're wrong, Chuck, but right now I think I'm right about that. Uh, anyways, let's try it out. Let me just check the chat and make sure that everything is solid. Cool, cool. All right. Now um, I've already downloaded it because it's like <laughs> pretty big. Uh, I want to install it right now. And I'm, I'm hoping it's a pretty quick install. Let's assume and hope and cross our fingers. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. So right here I can check, do I want to use Windows containers instead of Linux containers? And um, no, not right now. So let's go for it. Hopefully it's pretty quick. If, if it's not very quick, um, I do have a... Uh, uh, <laughs> A, a virtual machine that already has this installed. So we'll see how this goes. I should have started it way earlier. I wonder how fast it's going to be. How you guys doing today, by the way? Someone asked me what kind of coffee I'm drinking. You know, I've had, to, I've got this thing to where um, my eye keeps twitching. And I, this always happens to me when I drink too much coffee. And it's been this way for a few days. It's just twitching, twitching. I can't stop twitching. So I'm trying to, I haven't had my, my afternoon cup today. And I'm trying to like say no, it's hard. All right, it's going to take a bit, but let's pretend. Let's pretend it installs, and it goes through the process. And now let's go look at my virtual machine because I don't want to sit here and waste your time. So let me uh, bring my virtual machine over here. Where'd you go, bud? I just set up all my servers today that I moved from my data center. All right, here he is. Here he is. I really wish this thing would hurry up. No, this is going to take forever. My bad, guys. Anyways, once you have Docker for desktop running, it'll look something like this. You'll have this cool little tray icon. You can tr uh, log into your own desktop community thing. And uh, all you got to do is launch PowerShell. And you can run these images like 
like whatever, <laughs> like like you would on a Linux machine. Uh, let me expand this a bit. And um, I don't want to give it away. Get out of here, PowerShell. This Windows desktop machine needs to uh, be upgraded. I need to up, up the uh, stuff on the virtual machine because even typing is painful. Okay, here we go. Windows PowerShell. Now I want to adjust this font because it's so hard to read as is. Font. Let's make the sucker bigger. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about now. Okay, cool. Come on, hurry up. I, this is killing me. I wish it would just stink and load. Okay, there we go. It's, it's good. Okay, we're, we're here. All right, so just like uh, Docker on Linux, Docker PS. I can see my running Docker containers, which is, that's so cool. And I, as you can see, I already did CentOS and Alpine. I'll do Docker, pull, let's, uh, pull Ubuntu. Uh, hopefully it doesn't take too long. That seems to be going pretty quick. Maybe. Oh yeah, yeah, it's, it's going, it's going. It's not too bad. But I mean, I have to say, running Docker on Linux is cool. Running Linux Docker containers on Windows, I think is like, just for me, it's really, really cool because any of you right now can go out for free. I mean, most of us run Windows. Let's just be honest. Any of you right now can go out for free, download Docker, uh, run it as an application on your Windows machine. And then I honestly, I didn't have to enable the Windows sus subsystem for Linux, anything like I just installed Docker, had it decide I'm going to run Linux containers and it was ready to go. So just, just you can run any version, pretty much any version of Linux on your Windows machine like that because the Windows sub subsystem for Linux um, is Microsoft's Linux kernel they bit built built for their their uh, their systems so it's it's already running that kernel it's why it's super fast we can boot the stuff and why it works it's it's amazing so anyways um, I downloaded Ubuntu and if you don't recall the video I'll just show you real quick Docker um, run so we, we already downloaded our image we pulled it from the Docker hub and now we're gonna actually run or build our container by utilizing that image so I'll do Docker run dash uh, T uh, dash D, I could do dash T D if I wanted to. Um, those switches, I guess I can go ahead and tell you. I didn't tell you in the, the video, but those switches, um, this actually, uh, I believe it opens up a, a TTY for us. And so we can actually run this thing well. And then um, dash D is running in detached mode, which means it'll run without, like normally when you run a Docker container, um, it's like maybe for one executable or maybe you'll uh, want to remote into it immediately and do something running in detached mode is kind of like headless mode it'll just go like you're starting a service uh so dash d and i'm looking at the camera as i'm talking like you can see me i'm just it's just a habit anyways um dash t dash d i'll name this um my ubuntu and then i'll use the ubuntu image and it's running now that, that's just amazing docker ps it's uh it's there. I'll jump in there. Docker exec dash uh, it and dash i means interactive mode. Um, and my what was it? My Ubuntu. And then what was it? Oh yeah, uh, jump into Bash. And I'm there. I mean, like it has it has everything. It has its own file system. It's it's crazy cool. Now someone asked me, and actually I forgot where to look. I think it's um. Someone asked me, how, how can we verify we're in a different operating system? How can we know we're actually somewhere else? Uh, I believe the, 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 the file is over here. Let me find it real quick. I forget where it is, actually. How do I get this thing out of here? I want this Docker thing to disappear. Ah, what did I just click on? What did I just do? Um, I forget where it is, actually. Is it in uh, etc.? I think it's somewhere in etc. Like under like release. Oh, yeah. Uh, let's jump into OS release. Oh, so I can just cat OS release. Ah, there we go. Yeah, so if you if you just cat etc. OS release, um, it'll tell you what you're looking at. So here we go. Ubuntu 18.04. I mean, that's that's cool. And just a few more commands I did not cover before. You can actually stop. Well, we covered stopping the container. So stop my. Oh, actually, I'm no. I'm I'm still in Ubuntu. Let me back out. I can do um, docker stop Ubuntu. Oh no, it was my Ubuntu. 
And then I can even just remove the container altogether. And just like that, building up, tearing down, whatever. It's cool. So that, that was really the point of this video, just to say, hey, I was wrong. You can actually run Linux on Windows, not with just Windows subsystem for Linux um, and installing apps like that, but you can actually run Docker and then install Docker containers just as you would on Linux, which I think is, man, Windows is kind of killing it right now with, their, with them embracing Linux. I love that. Um, and wow, even more of a reason to start learning Linux. If Windows is telling you, hey, we're, we're kind of adopting some Linux stuff and we're putting it into our operating systems and now we're we're supporting a lot of it and look at the cloud. We have a ton of uh, Linux stuff on the cloud. It's it's here. It's here to stay. And I think you should learn it because it's I, I, I love it <laughs> for me going from a Cisco guy learning, you know, CLI commands going to Linux. It's like I feel like I'm at home. It's awesome. Anyways, that was pretty much the video. I'm going to answer some questions real quick uh, while we're here. Thanks for tuning in on a, at a whim, on a whim, on a Tuesday afternoon. Uh, I love that you guys can just kind of join me real quick. It's fun. Anyways, um, I, I did, actually, I'm going to answer some questions I had from my, my Docker video. Uh, one of the questions was, uh, how can we control, because there was confusion um, about how a Docker container, when it runs, it'll utilize the resources that your operating system has. So your operating system is interfacing with uh, your your physical server or whatever it is, and it's using you know the CPU, the memory, and all that, and it's divvying up those resources. Um, how does the application of Docker and, and those running containers, how can we limit how much CPU it's using? Because like on a virtual machine in a hypervisor situation, we can we can only give that virtual machine a certain amount of CPU um, utilization, or you know, a certain number of cores or amount of uh, virtual CPUs. Or we can only give it so much RAM. We can only give it so much storage space. On a Docker container, it wasn't apparent uh, when I was displaying it how we could control that. It, it, will it like just control our like if we have this really heavy Docker container, will it just destroy our system trying to consume everything? Uh, the short answer is. Um, I think theoretically it could, uh, but there are things put into place. So like the, the theory of containers, I, I touched on this a little bit with when I was talking about my Docker video. Uh, containers have been around for a very, very, very long time. I think they even predate virtualization and Linux gurus, Linux gods have been using containers uh, for a long time, but it's just been really hard to create containers. It's been hard to create the isolation because to basically do that, you had to be a Linux god. You had to be crazy good at Linux. Uh, so Docker is a company that came around, they actually had a name previously, I forget the history, but Docker came around and kind of made that process uh, more simple. So we call them Docker containers because we use Docker to create them as kind of a standard. Um, and they have their own engine inside Linux that runs and makes it easier. However, Docker isn't the only type of container you can do. There's LXC, another type. Um, and there's there's a few others, I think. I, I, I don't know the history. I'm, I'm kind of a... a a Docker noob, like like most of us are, uh, but it's just so fun to learn about it. So it's like, as soon as I learn about something, I'm like, I've got to, I've got to tell you guys because this is so cool. And I've used it in the past, but I, I wanted to dive a bit deeper and kind of talk about it with you guys. Um, but essentially, they use two concepts in Linux. They use the concept of, and I kind of talked about this. Uh, they use control groups and namespaces. And using Docker, you can um, kind of tweak those settings. And the control groups are basically how much are we giving each container? Um, are we gonna throttle how much they can use? So that's a control group basically. And the namespaces are how we how we isolate the application, how we isolate those pro those CPU processes and give them their own um, own, own everything pretty much. It's kind of a it's a weird it's a weird thing when you spend so much time in the typical system admin world when you're looking at virtualization and everything. It's a weird concept to come in and look at Docker and be like that's, I, I, it's, it's hard to wrap your mind around. So it took me a bit to kind of marinate in it and figure it out. Uh, but I, th I think it's fun. I think it's cool. Um, <laughs> Mr. Swanee, holy cow, I'm watching live. Yeah, I, I try to switch up the times given all the quarantine stuff to try and hit you guys on the, across the pond. Um, study material for the Linux Plus cert. You know what's great is um, CBC Nuggets just released. Uh, the entire Linux Plus certification playlist. Sean Powers, who, you know, if you've watched my channel, I've talked about him and I've interviewed him. Linux genius. Um, he he put it on. It's amazing. So, yeah, it's uh, there. Uh, Robert Olson, what am I using to learn Docker? So I used um, Sean Powers to uh, to initially, he has a great course on Docker to kind of get the basics. It's very practical. That's what I love learning. I love learning practically, just quickly doing something like, oh, I created a Docker container. I feel powerful. This is awesome. Um, but I wanted to find out more about how it works. 
So for that, I read a book, or some of a book, and then I also went to Pluralsight and watched, um, what's that guy's name? Let me, let me go find him. Uh, Docker, Pluralsight, like Nigel something. The dude's a beast. And I know, like, I'm a CBC Nuggets guy, but man, uh, we don't have Docker and stuff like this on our, our, um, our site just yet. We probably will very soon, but this Nigel guy is incredible. Nigel Poulton, yeah. So I, I, I binge watched a bunch of his stuff to kind of kind of get a grasp on really what Docker is. And that's kind of, I feel like um, so someone asked me, and I answer this question, should you go for the Docker certification? Because they do have a certification. It's a whole big world. I, I would say if you are like, if you're like heavy in DevOps and you've got people left and right asking you to work on, on Docker containers and you feel like it'll really help your job, but yeah, go for it. But it's one of those certifications where it's not really sought after. Like people aren't going, oh, I could really, I'm really hankering for a Docker certified individual. Like it's not like a popular thing to know about or to, to have. But knowing Docker and kind of what I covered in the video um, I made last week and, and maybe just going a bit deeper, I think is enough for most applications because um, I don't think like as a system admin or a network admin and, and even getting in more to the, uh, the automation and programming stuff, we're not gonna be deploying and building like these crazy complicated Docker containers. Um, building a Docker container or an image is quite the task. Um, you have to know about this concept of the Docker file, what the Docker file helps you orchestrate and, and put all these layers into building an image. It's, it's, it's a crazy thing. It's, that's why they have a certification, it's hard. Um, but as far as like, do you really need to go that deep into it? I don't. I don't think so. Um, especially like if you're dealing with cloud stuff, uh, I think there there are people whose roles are more governed around the fact that they're they're more developers or maybe DevOpsy people who are building these Docker images or containers. Now, it very well could be the fact that you, as you step into more of the cloud role and you maybe you get into more DevOps, that yeah, you're gonna be that that Docker container guy. And going even further beyond that, there's the the concept of Kubernetes. Well, not really a concept. It's it's a it's a it's a platform. Kubernetes is an orchestration for all these containers. So as you deploy all the, all these random containers, um, you want a, a method or a, a, a process to scale these up because you can you know you can deploy a hundred instances of a, a, a container and, and you'll you can scale your application like crazy. You'll need some kind of orchestration tool to keep track of things to mass deploy it. It's it's a whole big thing. Um, and that's why I think it's 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 a huge move. Now a lot of people on my video. We're like, Docker's never going to replace virtual machines, or it, it doesn't replace virtual machines. They're completely different. Um, and their argument was based on the fact that, well, a virtual machine is something you can remote into, and it's something we can install things on, and, and it has a GUI and everything. Noted, yeah, I know. But what I was saying is that I think Docker containers are going to replace virtual machines in, um, in the typical fashion in how we use virtual machines. The, the main purpose of a virtual machine for most companies is to have a place where you can install your application. Uh, whatever your programmers wrote, um, you gotta have a place to put those things. Uh, Docker solves that problem. Whatever application your programmers are writing can be uh, used inside a Docker container, and that gives us so many advantages over a virtual machine. So it, it's, it's just a big world. Anyways, I, I will, <laughs> I kinda went off for a bit, didn't I? Let's see, uh, Almighty Mech says, can I define the creation process? Um, so I'm actually still kind of uh, uncovering the process. I know you, a big part of it is using Docker files and using Docker Compose to create that Docker, um, and I hope, I hope you're talking about Docker, that Docker image. You can also make changes, like I, another question I had about Docker was uh, that container. The changes you make inside, when you create a file, when you make a change, are, do those just go away when you stop the container? No, no, they don't. Like it's, it's, it's a, <laughs> I, I don't wanna go too deep. Um, but a container, uh, you, there's a there's a writable layer. There's a writable layer on top that when you make changes to it, you can when you shut it down, bring it back up. Those changes are there. Um, you can also uh, commit those changes to your and create a new image off of your changes. So whatever you can, you know, change your container, tweak it, make it look cool, whatever. Like it, that website I showed you guys, you can make changes to the website. Then you can just do Docker commit and make those changes, and you can create a new image so that you have that that set and ready to go. That's kind of the the the, um, the process you should. It's that called continuous development, CI/CD. You don't want to make changes to the system. You want to kind of make changes to the process. 
So for example, if I were a developer and I were I had an app and I had a Docker container, I wouldn't be logging into that Docker container and making changes or adding my code to that container, that running container. No, that's bad. You don't do that. What you would do is you would make changes to the image, um, utilizing Docker Compose, Docker file and everything. And then instead of changing that running container, you would just destroy it. You would drop it and then deploy the new container because it's so quick, it's so fast. And that's that's the beauty of it. It's a weird thing. It's a weird thing. Um, Nathaniel says Docker is intended for single apps, separate container for each app. Sounds like you could easily have dozens of containers running. Sounds messy. Um, and that you're, you're exactly right. Docker uh, is meant for, um, it's really meant for running one application because you want to isolate. It's all about that micro, um, uh, gosh, micro infrastructure kind of, or am I, am I saying that right? <laughs> I feel like I'm getting tired. Um, microservices. There we go. Wow. Um, this is live. I forget things. Yeah, it's all about isolating parts of your app because, uh, again, having traditionally you would have your applications and your stack installed on one server, and it's like this monolith and so many points of failure. Docker allows us to be more more agile, um, more swift in how we design things, and it allows us to um, not have all these points of failure. It is, it does become messy, which is why we have these orchestration tools. Docker. Uh, I, I did receive some comments about how, well, isn't Docker kind of dying? Isn't it going away? I think the company Docker and their tools they've designed maybe is kind of hurting a bit because they they have their own orchestration tool, which again is an orchestration tool is how we can manage our Docker containers. We got a bunch out there. We need a way to kind of keep track of them. It's kind of like having a bunch of kids. You got to have a process. Believe me, I know. Um, so Docker Swarm was a, a software they wrote, a package they wrote to help uh, orchestrate all these Docker containers, uh, but Docker Swarm is kind of like not the not the industry standard. They kind of lost the battle. Kubernetes, which is the weirdest thing, and it's I love how they abbreviate it. It's um, uh, K eight S Kubernetes. I love that. I, I don't know why I love that, uh, but that's that's kind of the the standard. Um, so if you want to move into more DevOps roles, uh, dealing with Azure, AWS, and pretty much any any um, modern uh, shop. Kubernetes and Docker is something to learn as you go a bit deeper. Uh, da, da, da. How do you make a VPS with Docker? Uh, I don't, if you're meaning like a virtual private server, I don't think that's what it's designed to do or can be done. Um, how can you make, he's, he's, Kibox, you keep going. How do you make a full KVM VPS with Docker? Now, Docker is, you can install Docker on a virtual machine. So that, and actually a lot of people do that. That's what I do. Um, very, very rarely will I try to uh, uh, install one operating system on my bare metal server because I don't like feeling limited in my lab. So I'll, I'll install hypervisor like ESXi, which I do have running in my lab right now. And then I'll install Docker on, you know, whatever virtual machines I have. Uh, you can, um, from what I've read, I haven't tried it myself, but I will make a video about it. You can run a GUI from Docker. You can um, tie your Docker GUI to your your um, your main host machine's GUI. There's a way to do it. Uh, I'll I'll try and test it. Now the what I kind of now I'll say this, <laughs> I kind of kind of maybe assumed and kind of knew that I could run Linux containers on Windows, but I didn't mention it and I didn't really dig deep into it because I know the Windows subsystem for Linux on Windows Windows is kind of like people aren't very happy about it. Like it's not like production standard just yet. Like no one's like trusting it yet, I guess is what I'm saying. I'm sure it's great and it runs great, but um, developers don't really trust it yet to run their stuff on Windows. Their Linux-based stuff on Windows. Like why, why would we do that? Let's just run our Linux-based stuff on Linux. So I, I didn't want to mention that, oh, you can run Linux Docker containers on Windows because it's not really, I don't know who does that in production right now. I'm, I don't know. I, and I could be wrong because I, I don't deal with this, uh, this realm way, way too much. Now, wow, um, Ursus, thank you for the super chat. He says, thank you for all my vids. After five years in IT support, uh, I look to shift to systems infra infrastructure side, but overwhelmed with choice of path and technologies. Where do I start? Any chance to do a video on picking a path moving forward? Uh, so that's actually been a thing I've been looking at. There's two videos I'm kind of uh, thinking about making very soon. First is just a, a from scratch video. I just heard about IT or, I mean, this is really becoming a thing now because um, I have people asking me, I, I'm a waiter uh, or I work in a restaurant or whatever. And you know what happened? Coronavirus. And now I don't have a job. So now I have like a, 
a large amount of time to figure out what I want to do because obviously that job security is sucky. Uh, how do I get started in IT? Like, what, what's the path? I made a lot of videos kind of like, oh, this is what you can do. This is what cloud, like learn everything right now. That's kind of my thing, right? Um, I'm gonna make a video about how to start from scratch. Where do you go? Um, and then uh, it's kind of like a choose your own adventure thing. Like once you start down the path of IT, um, I think everyone pretty much has the entry level start of like, oh, I need to know what a computer is, does and know how to fix it. So let's start with A plus, right? Because that's where most people start out is on the help desk. So that, that's kind of the entry level. Uh, but then you can diverge into so many different areas. So I, I do need to make videos, um, maybe more than more than a couple about those different paths and how they diverge and how they're changing. Cause like, man, they change so rapidly and, and, and what's valuable changes so rapidly. So uh, you, I can see you've been in uh, IT support for five years and you wanna to shift to, to kind of the second tier or maybe even third tier role, becoming a system admin or a network admin overwhelm with choice. Now, what can make your, what can kind of narrow down your choices is uh, where you are right now. Um, if you're in, I assume you're still doing IT support and you're working for a company, what does your company use? If you look at the second tier support or the third tier support, what do, what do those guys know? What's their skill set? That's what you should do. That's the path you should go down. Um, you should go down the path where you have the most opportunity to get experience and hands-on um, experience. That's what you should do. Because um, getting experience in IT is the the hardest thing. Now, that even that itself is not like impossible. Like it's a lot harder to get started in other industries. I think IT is the easiest industry to break into and the most lucrative. I mean, it's killer. It's like you're cheating life. I love it so much. Um, but I think that choose the path that you know you can get hands on faster. So if you are in your IT support role right now and you know that hey your your company uses Microsoft Exchange and they have one guy doing it and he is, he's the, he, he's gets, he gets tired and he's always called in and he hates it because he's the only guy and he, that, that, that's a sucky situation. Maybe you should learn Microsoft Exchange. It, it would set you up pretty good. So, and you know, just wh whatever it is, Azure, AWS, is it networking? Like I'm sure there's a second tier, third tier that needs help and you can be that guy. And, and I'll tell you a secret. I mean, people, companies love hiring from within, they love promoting from within, because uh, there's one thing they're sure of when they see you, they know that you're a culture fit, they know that they know your personality. And um, that's always the wild card when you hire somebody, they can have a great resume, you can go out and, and like, oh, wow, they have like 15,000 certifications, they have 20,000 years of experience, I want to hire that guy. And they get in and like, they just they, they rub everyone the wrong way. <laughs> they they made enemies immediately. And it's 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 the X factor that you really can't anticipate until they're there. Um, they can even fake it in the interview. They just may be horrible to work with. And when you have someone who doesn't mesh with people well, then it doesn't, I don't I don't care how smart they are, <laughs> it'll never work out. So that's what I would do. Um, Hundred percent every time. Look at your your path you have before you, look at the people who are above you and say, how can I get there? What are they learning? What are they studying? I would become their buddy, shadow those people. Um, and thank you for the super chat. That was awesome. Well, guys, um, I told my wife this would be super quick and I already kind of lied to her because it's not been, it's, it's shorter than most of my live streams, but I'm gonna go make dinner now because uh, it's kind of a hobby I picked up doing the home chef thing. Anyways, I'm gonna stop rambling. Uh, guys, I hope you're having a safe time. Um, I hope you're staying as isolated as most Docker containers are. <laughs> that joke, I, I, I made it in the video. If you didn't make it that far, I just wanted to say it again because I feel like <laughs> I love that joke. Um, yeah, stay safe out there. Um, stay home. Don't go anywhere. I'm fighting the urge. I've already this week three times told my wife, I really want to build a computer. Another one. Um, I'm going to go to Micro Center. She's like, no, honey, that's not essential. You need to stay home. I'm like, but they have store pickup. I'll just, I'll just order online. I can just walk in. She's like, no, don't do that. Stay home. It's not essential. I'm like, okay, fine, fine. Um, I know, and you got to do your part, right? Like we all have, like I, I can think, oh, just me going is not a big deal. We all have to do our part. And whatever your opinion is on it, I, I don't know how crazy it, it actually is. The coronavirus is. I, I don't know. Um, I hear it's crazy. I hear it's not. And then that changes from day to day. So you know what? I'm gonna play it safe. <laughs> I'm gonna isolate myself because you know what? If I had a computer virus in my network, you know, the first thing I would do is I would cut off the systems I know that have the virus. I would isolate those things. And, and that's, that's kind of how I approach this. I have an IT mindset. If you let the virus spread, your company's going down. And, um, 
Let's just play it safe. Um, Elias, thank you for the super chat. Uh, Ola Chuck, I know you're all in the um, CBT Nuggets. I did become a member in all. Uh, thank you. But what do you think about LinkedIn Learning? Um, you get it for free. I use LinkedIn. I got a secret. I, I subscribe to a lot of learning resources because I'm always trying to learn things from a different angle, from a different perspective. Um, I think it's fine. Um, so like every platform, except for CBT Nuggets, uh, there are some trainers on there who are great and some who are like, what, what did you just say? <laughs> what did you just make? Or you are dead asleep because it's not like the worst thing. It's a mixed bag. So like with a platform like LinkedIn Learning where they have so many trainers that maybe don't do it full time, there's kind of their they're professionals, but they don't really have the skill for teaching or online video creation. It's a mixed bag, which is why, shameless plug, it's why I love CBT Nuggets because um, they don't just go after people who are geniuses in the industry. They curate trainers who um, who can teach. They curate people who have a passion for it. And that's what they look for. So when you watch CBT Nuggets, you're not going to find boring material. You're going to find engaging material. You're going to find people who really are passionate about, first of all, what they do and also making sure you know what it is and, and, and teaching you. So that, that's kind of the, the difference with what I, you know, all those other training platforms where they have so many instructors and you, you think they're great because they have 25 years of experience, but man, if they don't have the passion and drive to, and, and the, uh, the ability to make it relatable, Ah, it's difficult. But yeah, so LinkedIn Learning, I can't like point to a specific course that I've loved, but I'll, I'll use bits and pieces of it when I need to like dive deeper into something. But yeah, it's it's good. So <laughs> if you have it, use it when you can. Uh, but don't get caught in the trap of having so many resources that you're like keep bouncing back and forth between some. Pick one good course and finish it like that. I know how fresh I've, I've been there because I, God. <laughs> I've been there so much where I've tried to like, oh, I love this and I love this over here. And I love, no, 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 just stick with one course. That's what I would do. All right, guys, I'm going to actually, <laughs> Ursa said, uh, uh, Marco Center is essential. I, I tried that. She said no. Oh, Elias, thank you again for the super chat. All right, guys, um, if you have any more questions, I will be live streaming every single week. I'm still on the fence about Tuesday or Monday. Um, I have this thing I'm doing with church on Monday, but anyways, I'm done. Hope you guys are staying safe. I, I hope you're studying, and um, but also keeping yourself sane because I know it's it's rough having your kids home and trying to work and then trying to balance study. I know it's a whole new dynamic, but wh what I told in my quarantine video, embrace the chaos. Find a way to work within it. Don't try to avoid it. Don't try to stop it. Embrace it. Um, and maybe I should make a video about that because it's I had to do that when I first started working from home two years ago and actually homeschooling my kids at the same time. It's not easy. I know. So anyways, I'll talk to you guys later.